An insanity plea wraps up a North Carolina murder trial. And a memorial service on campus honors a beloved professor. I'm Abigail Brown. And I'm Alexis Clinton. Those stories and more coming up on Carolina News Today. Carolina News Today is brought to you in part by the Wing Company of Pembroke, serving award-winning wings, fresh, not frozen. Live Entertainment Weekly, 703 West 3rd Street in Pembroke. 10% discount for students and teachers every day. The original wingco.com. Alumni back in town for homecoming were rewarded with a high-scoring football game and an Eagles cover bandage pack. Tyler Hughes will tell you about that game against the Concord Cougars and about the team's new uniforms later in the show. The week of festivities started off with Spirit Fest, sponsored by the Residence Hall Association. The annual celebration on the UC lawn included music, line dancing, and free food. And you could relive your childhood on those inflatables or compete on the inflatable obstacle course. After a week of decorating contests on campus, Thursday's homecoming parade started at Pembroke Middle School and wound its way through downtown until reaching Grace P. Johnson Stadium. The marching band and spirit squad set the tone ahead of the competitive float staged by student organizations. Miss UNCP Taylor Strickland made an appearance, as did Chancellor Cummings. Friday night, the university recognized some distinguished alumni in a ceremony at the UC Annex. After a brief reception of hors d'oeuvres and drinks, Candace Langston was named Outstanding Young Alumna. She is a clinical exercise physiologist who has helped develop several community-based programs for Southeastern Health. Dr. Paul Nelson Locklear is the principal at Oxendine Elementary School and was named Outstanding Alumnus. Attorney Arnold Locklear has been active in university philanthropy and received the Distinguished Service Award. Saturday, the students' homecoming court was recognized on the football field at halftime. Music major Paul Anderson was elected homecoming king, and public relations major Shanoa Rain was elected queen. She was crowned by Miss UNCP Taylor Strickland in the absence of last year's queen. Friends and family of the late Dr. Stephen Birkin met Sunday for a memorial service in his honor. Birkin was chair of the math and computer science department, who died suddenly and unexpectedly at the beginning of the semester. <clears throat> Although not an official university event, colleagues reserved the UC Annex to eulogize the man, an award-winning math professor who was also a great friend to the Division of Athletics. Dr. Birkin was hired at UNCP in 2003 and helped bring the football back to the school. Known for his athleticism, he was a mentor to the football team, but also served briefly as Dean of the Honors College. Dr. B helped many students get over their math phobia in gen ed classes, statistics, and calculus. The second time I saw Dr. B was in his calculus class. And I'm sitting there on the first day, I'm scared to death, I'm about to take calculus. And uh, then comes Dr. B. As always, tremendous energy. And uh, I said, you've got to be kidding me. The nice muscle head from the gym teaches calculus. This has got to be one of the most unique individuals I've ever met. Well, I was wrong about Dr. B. Uh, he was not only a phenomenal calculus professor, he was a great mentor, he was a great friend, and most importantly, he was a great person. Colleagues have started a scholarship fund in Dr. Birkin's name. For more information on that, you can contact the university's advancement office. The North Carolina Rural Infrastructure Authority has approved 21 grant requests statewide, including a $25,000 grant to the city of Lumberton. The grant will support the renovation of a 1,900 square foot building for use by a Cold Stone Creamery franchise. The project is expected to create five jobs and come with at least $560,000 in private investments. Not guilty by reason of insanity, that's the decision for Oliver Machada, a North Carolina teen charged with killing his mother. Authorities say the 19-year-old who was charged with first-degree murder has serious mental issues. Police say that in 2017, Machado stabbed his mother and then decapitated her. I just want to say I'm sorry if I let my family down. And, and let's hope, let's hope God forgives me. Overwhelmingly, the evidence is is that he was uh, undergoing a, a you know florid schizophrenic event at this time, and that's what precipitated this crime. The doctor testified in the courtroom that Machada is still very dangerous. 
Machado will most likely spend the rest of his life in the state mental hospital. Last week, we told you about the fatal shooting of a state trooper with connections to Robeson County. This week, a teenager is charged in his death. According to the Robesonian newspaper, 18-year-old Chauncey Askew was arrested in Laura, South Carolina. He's the sus second suspect charged in the crime. He was taken into custody after a 24-hour manhunt involving multiple law enforcement agencies. Askew was charged with first-degree murder and is awaiting extradition back in North Carolina. A Fort Bragg paratrooper is accused of kidnapping and raping a 12-year-old girl, according to the Craven County Sheriff's Office. Matthew Herchick reports. 19-year-old James Murdoch Peel, a member of the United States Army stationed at Fort Bragg, is in custody in Craven County as he faces charges of first-degree burglary and first-degree statutory rape. Officials say he kidnapped a 12-year-old girl early Sunday morning and could face even more charges. What could have happened to this young lady is, uh, is really scary, and I want people to take and be aware of those things, and uh, we just live in a different world now. Monette says the victim was taken from her grandmother's home early Sunday morning in Carolina Pines. He says her grandmother found a ransom note requesting money for her safe return. The girl was found several hours later in Fayetteville. Monette says this case involves internet chat rooms, but could not verify what social media platform was used. And there are those that are out there that would seek to take advantage of our children, and uh, many are deviant. Uh, they don't, they, their intent and purpose is not for good things. The Craven County Sheriff's Office was assisted by the SBI, FBI, and Army in their search for the victim who was located within approximately seven to eight hours. We pulled a tremendous amount of resources in a very short period of time. And like Sheriff said, everybody hit the ground running and did a phenomenal job. And Sheriff Monette warns guardians not to give their children too much privacy. Because of the internet today, these are types of things that we've got to be, be on guard about. The alleged victim is now back home with her grandmother. Officials say Peel could face military charges as well. North Carolina Attorney General Josh Stein is leading a coalition of colleagues from 32 other states calling on the Consumer Financial Bureau Protection Bureau to continue protecting military service members from predatory lenders. In a letter to the Bureau, Stein urged them to reconsider their decision to stop examining lenders who were supposed to comply with the Military Lending Act. The law was enacted in 2006 to protect military families from exploitive loans and excessive debt. North Carolina will receive $27 million over the next year to help fight the state's opioid epidemic. The one-year grant was awarded by the Centers for Disease Control. It aims to strengthen statewide monitoring of the opioid epidemic and local responses to it. The funds will also go towards a pilot program to work with families whose children are at risk of being removed from the home because of parental substance abuse. Someone in South Carolina is waking up a heck of a lot richer today. Just one winning ticket was sold there for Tuesday night's record-breaking Mega Millions jackpot, or should we say Mega Billions. Omar Jamez is in South Carolina where he might be able to hear the excited screams of that lucky ticket holder. Tonight's Mega Millions jackpot is a record-breaking $1.6 billion. This was the moment people across the country sat tensely, hoping their prayers were answered. But in the end, there was only one. That's right, one winning ticket sold in South Carolina for the largest lottery jackpot to ever be offered, $1.6 billion. The chances were basically zero, one in about 302 million. Your chances of getting struck by lightning are only one in 700,000. Leading up to this, people had many different plans about what they were going to do with the money. I would enjoy a little bit of it with me and my family, but I would make other people's lives better by my gain. I'd share the wealth, I'd give money to a lot of some schools and some churches and help people along. But now it's ultimately up to the one winner to decide how to spend the money and whether they want to take it all in a lump sum or gradually over the course of about 30 years. And yes, the Mega Millions is over for now, but the madness isn't. Powerball is up next with a chance at $620 million. Early voting in Lumberton is underway for the November 6th midterms. The first three days of early voting have seen an increase in participation with over 2,600 ballots cast, a 34% increase compared to the 2014 general election. Officials say the increased interest mirrors what is being seen across the state. Early voting continues through the next two weeks and ends November 3rd. 
The North Carolina Department of Transportation seeks input from the public about their long-range transportation plans. They're also warning motorists about deer crossing now that fall is here. It's NCDOT now. Welcome to this week's edition of NCDOT Now. I'm your host, Miracle King. As daylight hours are getting shorter and deer are becoming more active on our roadways, the North Carolina Department of Transportation is reminding drivers to pay extra attention and stay alert. Last year in North Carolina, there were more than 18,000 animal-related crashes, most of which involved deer. Over the past three years, more than 54,000 animal-related collisions have killed 14 people, injured over 3,000, and caused nearly $141 million in property damage. The highest number, 882 of these types of crashes, occurred in Wake County and Guilford County, which had 617, but they are reported in every county across the state. To keep you and your family safe, remember to slow down in posted deer crossing areas and heavily wooded areas, especially during the late afternoon or early evening. Don't swerve to avoid a collision. This could cause you to lose control or veer into oncoming traffic. And deer often travel in groups, so assume if one crosses the road in front of you, there may be others following. The Department of Transportation wants to hear from you as it updates its long-range transportation plan called the NC Moves 2050 plan. The document will provide a blueprint that identifies local transportation needs to ensure that North Carolina's transportation system keeps people moving safely and efficiently while enhancing the economy. Take a quick survey and provide your thoughts at the link shown. Lastly, get ready for the perfect fall day filled with barbecue, live music, and family-friendly attractions as NC by Train gets you to the free Lexington Barbecue Festival on October 27th, dropping you off steps from the fun at the Welcome Center. Passengers can board at any of these stations shown and save 15% on tickets by visiting ncbytrain.org. That's all for this week's edition of NCDOT Now. Don't forget, you can still visit NCDOT's Safety City, Roadside Environmental Unit, and NCDMV booths at this year's NC State Fair this weekend. Thanks for stopping by, and we hope to see you next year. As always, be sure to stay connected with us on Facebook and Twitter at NCDOT. You can also follow us on Snapchat and Instagram at NCDOT.com. From all of us here at the North Carolina Department of Transportation, safe travels. As thousands of migrants from Central America prepare to resume their trek across Mexico towards the U.S. border, President Trump has a warning, telling reporters he's considering a military option beyond the National Guard to protect the border. He says people should not be able to enter the U.S. illegally. Another dawn at the migrant caravan heading to the United States. Another night sleeping on concrete for thousands of people. Some get ready for the day. Children play a game as if they were still home. Others decide to sleep a, a little longer. Maria Antonia breastfeeds her two-month-old daughter Estrella on the pavement where they spent the night. Maria Antonia says she's leaving Honduras so that Estrella can have a future. There isn't any work here, she says. We have nothing to live on. On the same block, Kevin asked people for coins. He's traveling alone to join an older brother in the U.S., hoping to send money back home. He says he is 14 but looks much younger. We aren't showing his face to keep him safe. I came here, he tells me, so I could work and eat and help my family. Over in the town plaza, Brian is figuring out how to get back to the U.S. He will walk as long as it takes to reunite with his three-year-old daughter, an American citizen. She's, she's the one who actually needs me the most, you know, so, and I don't want her to grow without me, so. They have over a thousand miles to go to the U.S.-Mexico border, where they will not be welcome. The Trump administration is pressuring the Mexican government to deport more than 7,000 members of this migrant caravan back home because they say there could be terrorists or dangerous gang members in their midst. But literally everyone we have talked to here says the exact opposite. They're not gang members, they're their victims. Maria Antonia says Honduras' out-of-control gangs extort everyone. 
sometimes for just a few dollars. That's why we came, she tells me. They charge war taxes there. If you don't pay, they kill you. She says she hopes her baby daughter is too young to remember the hell they are fleeing from and the hell they are living now. Patrick Gottman, CNN, Huizcla, Mexico. Those meat-free burgers might not be much healthier than a regular beef burger. They often even have more salt than your basic meat burger. That's according to a new study by the UK group Action on Salt. The study compared 157 meat-free products. More than a quarter had more salt than it's recommended you get. Both are high in sodium, though. The meat substitutes contain an average of 0.89 grams of salt per serving, while real beef burgers average 0.75 grams per portion. Braves football puts on a show for its homecoming crowd. And a pair of twins continue to stand out for Pembroke Athletics. We'll be back soon. Don't turn the channel. Sports is up next. Football closed out homecoming week in Braves Athletics with a bang. One of the most exciting parts was the unveiling of their new uniforms. These alternate gold jerseys paid homage to the Lumbee Tribe. It sports the tribe patch on the, on the left chest and... Can you redo it? Oh, sorry, and Rock's tribal marks on both sleeves. These homecoming suits were even featured on ESPN's Gear Up segment on SportsCenter and College Game Day. The new unis became the Braves' third official jersey. When the jersey reveal came out, everyone was like jumping around and stuff like that. We we loved them. Um, uh, I think I think they match our school really well and it represents the right thing. And we're excited to be able to wear something like this. Now the saying goes: If you look good, you feel good. You feel good, then you play good. With the Braves in their new uniforms, there was no way they could have played bad. For the past two games, including this one against Concord, the offense has put 86 points. We'll start with the Braves receiving the kickoff after a Concord field goal. Devin Jones takes the kick, makes a few guys miss, and follows his blocks 97 yards to the house. Later in the first, with UNCP driving, quarterback Josh Jones tosses a seven-yard touchdown pass to McKinley Nelson out of the backfield. Braves are up 14-10 at the end of the quarter. 8.40 left in the second quarter and Concord quarterback Adam Fulton dimes a pass to Isaiah Bowman for a 37-yard touchdown to put them up by three. After a seven-yard touchdown run by Joshua Dale, Tyler Hinton and the Braves defense came up with a strip sack, recovered and returned by Amari Bryce Green. This would put them in prime position for a Josh Jones Quay three touchdown connection. With the black and gold leading 35 to 17, heading into the fourth, Joshua Dale finds Quad Williams on a shovel pass and he finds the end zone with help from downfield blocking. Concord responded, scoring two straight touchdowns, but Joshua Dale would link with tight end Jalen Nixon on a 27-yard pass for his second throwing touchdown of the game. After the score, the extra point attempt is blocked by the Mountain Lions and returned 93 yards for two points by sophomore defensive back Jonathan Roebuck. Back on defense, a pass goes into the air, but is intercepted by linebacker Jordan Howard to seal the game for the Braves. Quarterback Josh Jones threw for two touchdowns, while his counterpart, Joshua Dale, also threw for two touchdowns and ran for one also. After the game, Dale talked about the quarterback duo. Me and him are real close, so we always help each other out, but I mean, it's always competitive no matter what we're doing. So we're, we're always pushing each other to get better, regardless of the circumstances. So, and I mean, we're close, so we just do what we got to do and help each other out and try to make this team better. The Ryan Twins picked up PBC honors this week for soccer. Gina Ryan has been awarded her fourth career PBC Goalkeeper of the Week recognition. Katie Ryan, on the other hand, is the PBC Defender of the Week. This comes after their performances against USC Aiken in a 5-0 shutout win and 2-2 tie against Georgia College. Staying with soccer, the Black and Gold stayed in Pembroke on Tuesday against number 25 Georgia looking to stay undefeated at home. The game went scoreless through two periods, but in overtime, sophomore Riley Searing netted her first goal of the season on a corner kick that lifted the Braves over the Nighthawks. This was the first time they beat North Georgia at home since 2012. 
No team has scored against the Braves in Pembroke this season. Senior night, their last home game, is Friday against Young Harris. Silas Kipkowicz was no stranger to the spotlight in his freshman season last year. The highly touted runner broke records and set school bests regularly. And he did it again at the Bobcat Invitational hosted by Georgia College on Saturday. He ran the AK in 24 minutes and 8 seconds while leading the men's cross-country team to its first event title of the season. All of this just to say that he was named PBC Runner of the Week. Silas continues to shine for the black and gold. As a part of homecoming festivities, the Department of the Athletics inducted five former student athletes into the Hall of Fame Friday night. The ceremony in the UC Annex took place in conjunction with the annual Alumni Awards. Among those in attendance were track star Jerry Stansel, an All-American back in the 1970s when Pembroke State University was still in the NAIA. He finished his career at Pembroke in NCAA Division II, breaking or matching school records in the 100-meter dash and the 200. Hoop star Dwayne Watson shattered two backboards in his college career and had season averages such as 18 and 19 points per game in the late 1980s under head coach Dan Kenny. His team had the best season in school history during his last year with 27 wins and five losses. From the starting season of Pembroke's return to football, punter Justin Hinson was inducted for his school record average of 43 yards per punt. He played in 31 games for the Braves and earned All-American honors from three organizations. Homecoming week also means Braves fans get a sneak peek at the men's and women's basketball teams. Dunk contests and fan interaction in three-point contests were highlights of the 8th annual Moonlight Madness in Jones Center Thursday. But both the women's and men's teams got scrimmage action that showcased the starting lineups. These competitions also gave red shirts and some other hopefuls a little time in front of the fans. Free concessions and other giveaways, mixed with a live DJ, kept fans excited to be there. The men are in action November 1st in an exhibition game at Ohio State, and the women travel to Georgia November 9th to take on Southern Wesleyan. I'm Ty the Sports Guy. That's it for me. Back to the studio. Thanks, Tyler. And that's it for us. We'll be back next week with another episode of Carolina News Today.